Stone, thanks so much. That's a nice way to end it as we join Michelle Meyer of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, really to focus on housing. But I first want to talk about your GDP call. You and Ethan Harris have been out front with, I'm going to say, a more cautious call. What do the relative optimists get wrong right now? Um, I, I think what people are missing is the extent to which there's going to be fiscal tightening in the second half of this year um, and into the turn of the year. Um, yes, we understand there's momentum right now. Um, we're encouraged by some of the labor market indicators, mm -hmm. but we're not yet convinced. And given the amount of fiscal tightening, you th we think there will be another uncertainty shock for business. fiscal drag? Two percent? It, well, if there's no change in legislation, it could be as big as 4%. Now, that's not our expectation. Our right. baseline view is something like 2%. Right. But there's the possibility of even larger tightening if you don't see policy. Okay, let's look at your note here. We're going to talk here about something I get a lot of mail on. Should I rent or should I buy? I never give my opinion. There's been a dramatic population shift from ownership into renting. There's been 4.2 million renters since the beginning of the crisis, 1.2 million homeowners lost over the same period, but this is dynamic now, isn't it? Yes, that's a dramatic shift in a short period of time. This is a very big change in the type of housing stock we need to see as a result. This shift from ownership to renting means we don't have enough rental inventory to meet that demand. And that's why we've seen a move over to greater multifamily mm. construction and calls for an REO to rental plan. Is the elasticity, the responsiveness of contractors to the market different in renting than owning? If rents go higher, do they come in with a vengeance and build condos? They are. They already are. You're seeing multifamily permits up pretty sharply. They're, they're, they're coming into the market given how attractive rental yields are. And given the long-term trajectory, I'm sure they're looking ahead and saying this continued shift into renting means we need right. to build more. Let's look at this chart. The y-axis is messed up. Go with it, folks. We've got some technical challenges today. This is the ratio of owning to rent. It's essentially the Case-Shiller price index over the OER rent equivalent. Up we go. That's the housing boom. Rental, no. Buy, yes. Prices up. There's the collapse. And then we roll over into new rental strength, don't we? Everywhere? Uh, it's not everywhere, and that's a very important point, is that we're talking about the housing market nationally, and of course, depending on where you are on a regional basis, it could vary quite a lot. Where we're seeing a lot of the rental prices, or uh, inflation is in the top metro areas where there's a lot greater concentration of apartments and people are shifting into the big cities. Uh, you're not seeing as much rent inflation in single-family homes. Mm -hmm. There's some nuances here. This is a confusing chart, but I'm going to throw it up anyways. Elegant one. This is normalized vacancies of houses, the white line, and rents, the vacancies of rents. And the answer, what's great about this, Michelle, is how the red line goes up about 2009. I mean, there was a, there was a delay for this new strength in rents. There's a lot of rental vacancies two or three years ago. Where'd they all go? Well, they've been absor absorbed, uh, not all of them, but a good amount. So the, re the rental vacancy rate's been coming down as people are shifting into the rental market. And the demand, the fact that the vacancy rate's coming down means that the move in rental demand is outpacing the move in rental supply. We have seen an Can increase. Can that supply come on? That's the key question the, for me. The, and that should be the key question because that's going to dictate quite a lot in terms of future construction right. and rent prices. And I think yes, but it's slow. It's slow. It's, it's, it's slow to come on. How's this going to fold into core inflation? Because rental, I mean, clinic, this is like a Richard Yamarone question. The answer is, when you look at core, like a third of it is real estate, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Which is about what we normally pay each month when you think about it. Absolutely. Um, particularly for core PC, it's a little bit less than a third. For core CPI, it's right. bigger. But it's a large chunk. And you're already seeing some upward pressure for Pushes rent. Core up. And it pushes up core inflation. So far, we haven't seen a decisive shift. <clears throat> but if this trend continues, it could be an upside risk for core inflation. Bring up chart eight, if you would, there, Elaine. I want to show this uh, 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 a popular, we've shown this many times, population adjusted housing. I mean, if all this dynamics, this bowl of soup called housing is there, and the president's going to speak on this in the 1 o'clock hour, <coughs> excuse me, there's a trend in housing. Up we go, the housing boom, new home sales, we roll over, population adjusted. What can public policy do on the rent side, on the foreclosure side, on the shadow inventory side? What's the mayoral prescription there? 
Well, there's been a number of policies attempted. Most of them so far have been focused on trying to prevent foreclosures, and I think we should continue to see effort in that respect. But I also think that some attention is moving towards trying to effectively clear the foreclosure inventory. And that, to me, is a very good sign, because if they could put in place an REO to rental plan that takes these foreclosures that are on the market for sale, renovates them, which supports housing construction and the construction sector. And rents them out. And rents them out. You're satisfying the increase in demand. Why would we not do that? Well, Please well, explain. Yeah, it, it, it's happening already. We already have a pilot program. There's talks of, of a bigger program. And it's happening in the private market as well. Investors are a large share of housing activity, and they're already starting to renovate and put properties onto the market. There's housing question. Should I rent or buy? <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> Should I rent or buy? How long do you want to stay in the property? Oh, yeah, yeah. please. Okay, here we go. Consumption. Let's move on back to the caution of the Bank of America Merrill Lynch call. Too much information. Consumption, 70% of the economy. This is uh, uh, the consumption distinction where we look at that in the middle of the last decade. Pretty good, way above the 2% level. There's the crisis, even in the negative consumption. And then we come up and we roll over. What's going to happen there? I think consumer spending will continue to lag the recovery as it has been. Um, consumer spending is coming back in certain parts. So you are seeing an increase in spending for retail goods, for durable goods, auto sales were strong. The areas where there's pent up demand, it's being realized. But where consumers <clears throat> have been cutting back is more in terms of services spending. And that shows that consumers are still budget constrained. And that's a view that we think will continue. What, what, you got a 2%, let's say. GDP. Throw on your inflation on top of that. What's your inflation on top of that? Almost 2%. For so it's still a sub 4% nominal GDP. It is. It is. Not it's, very good. it's not very good. Okay, Michelle Meyer, thank you so much for that caution. What is that different than Drew Mattis yesterday at UBS? I'm watching gold. Pound today, we're negative 201 on the Dow. Gold down $35, way below 1700 an ounce. Coming up, Politics, his 14th interview of the day, Matthew Dowd, Surveillance Midday.